Hello, welcome to our second book review. For those of you that were with us last week, we discussed Shinwa Achibe's Things Fall Apart. Went into details concerning the plot summary, literary devices, and a host of other things that were included in the book. This week, I'm super excited because we're going to be discussing a book that's a personal favorite of mine, Anwa. Now, Anwa is a is a, actually a play written by Ghanaian playwright Amate Du. The book was published in 1970, and the setting of the book is in a town called Kibi on the coast of Ghana in Africa in 1870. The play that we are discussing is centered around our female protagonist, Anwa. The play is opened or rather narrated by two narrators, a male and a female, who are referred to in the book as the mouth that eats salt and pepper. Now they open the play by relaying how their village is prosperous, how the gods have blessed them, and how everything is working out well for everybody in the town. However, they go on to mention that they have an oddity in the village who happens to be a person named Anwa. The woman is of the opinion that Anwa should be a priestess, however, the man, narrator, disagrees. From this opening scene, we are introduced to Anwa, who is fetching water. During the scene, we, we realize that Anwa has a conversation with Kofi Ako, and both of them seem to be in love with each other. Anwa then returns home and tells her mother and father that she has found the man that she wants to marry, Kofi Ako. Both parents are not happy with this information that is provided to them by their daughter. First of all, because they consider Kofi Ako as both vain and lazy. And additionally, it is unheard of for a lady or a woman to choose her own suitor in the society that they are in because it goes against tradition. I have to mention here that several times her parents have brought suitors to her for her to get married to, but she always refuses. So right from the beginning, we realized that um, Anawa is a Anawa the protagonist is someone that is set in her ways that moves against tradition that refuses to toe the line that has been set for her and that is what we come to know about her because after her parents refuse or ban her from marrying Kofi Ako, she gets upset, leaves her family house and says that she's leaving with Kofi Ako to get married. The next scene after Anwa leaves her parents' house jumps to two years ahead of time. Kofi Ako and Anwa are on the road. Anwa has still not conceived and seems very disturbed about this fact. See, she urges her husband Kofi Ako to take a new wife who can bear him children, but he adamantly refuses. Later on, as Anwa is sleeping, Kofi Ako is solo crying to himself, wondering why his wife cannot be more traditional because Anwa wants to work. Anwa wants to help him. She doesn't want to stay home and take care of the house like a traditional woman would at that time. And even though he really loves his wife, he still questions why she's not the traditional kind of woman who is more malleable, who falls in with tradition. Later on, Kofi Ako suggests to Anwa that they purchase or buy slaves to help them with their business and with activities at home. Anwa vehemently disagrees with this. She does not like the idea at all. Despite this, Kofi Ako decides to take masters into his own hands and purchase his slaves. That is something that we already know Anwa doesn't like, but as it's, a, it's a significant point in the story because we see that for once, Kofi Ako takes the lead on something despite um, Anwa's disagreement with him. Fast forward, we are moved into the ha into the house of Anwa's parents where they are discussing the fact that they haven't seen their daughter in a very long while. They also talk about the fact that the couple is now rich and buying slaves. By now, it's public knowledge or information that Anwa does not like the idea of buying slaves. Her parents wonder why this is a problem for her since now buying slaves is something that is common that everybody is involved in. So some time has now passed and Kofi Ako and Anwa are obviously older. Still, however, Anwa does not have a child. This is something that we can see really troubles Anwa as she again suggests her husband to take another wife who can bear him a child. He again vehemently refuses, very upset at the notion or by the idea that he should marry another woman who will bear him a child. By this time, Anwa is increasingly beginning to get restless and unsatisfied with her life. She wants to do more help Kofi Ako with chores, but she's bad from doing that. She can't carry things and slaves do everything for her. Something that, again, is really an issue that she struggles with. And Kofi Ako is wondering to himself why Anwa will not settle into her role of being a wife and manage 
um, household affairs and insist on running the family business with him we have to keep in mind that this is unheard of especially at the time that the story is set in because women have a very specific role that tradition and society takes for them they stay home they bear children they take care of the house this is not the case with Anwar first of all she does not like the idea that um, they uh, they purchase slaves she also does not like the idea that all she does is stay home she does not like the idea that she's not allowed to do anything and slaves have to do everything for her enter the old man and woman they realize that um despite the fact that the couple is now healthy wealthy they are still unhappy and they still do not have kids the old woman blames anwa for this problem that the couple is experiencing and um, suggests that very soon kofi Ako is going to gain the upper hand in the marriage so this should tell you that based on everything that the story is about or based on the the idea or the sentiment expressed by the old woman Arisa, that Kofi Akut does not have the upper hand in his marriage and it's rather Anwar that does which is another thing that is in confrontation with tradition per tradition men have the upper hand in their marriage but in Anwar and Kofi Akut's case Anwar is a person that has the upper hand that is why the old woman is suggesting that very soon Kofi Akut will gain the upper hand in their marriage so the play jumps years ahead into time Kofi Ako is now the wealthiest man in town and through the play we realize that his dressing is sharply contrasted by the way his wife Anwar is dressed she's dressed in tattered and um, shabby clothes and considering the fact that they are now the wealthiest couple in town it seems to be an oddity again Anwar still does not have children and the couple became so wealthy because they um, bought a large um, number of slaves which helped with their business Anwar is unhappy in her marriage so is Kofi Ako um, Anwar again suggests to Kofi Ako that he marries another woman to give him a child he refuses in his anger he tells Anwar to leave his house and that he will provide her with a house and slaves and everything she needs back in their hometown maybe because she cannot give him a child when he says this Anwar angrily retorts back at him that he is impotent and that he has exchanged his manhood for wealth. Kofi Ako is angered by this, runs outside and the next thing that we hear are gunshots. The scene closes with Anwar's laughter. Later on during their funeral procession back home in Nibi, we are told that Kofi Ako commits suicide by shooting himself and Anwar drowns herself. So this once happy and loved couple both ended their lives in tragedy. The old woman still blames Anwar for the unfortunate incidents that happened to them. However, the old man is of the opinion that perhaps if the villagers had treated Anwar a little bit more differently, things would not have ended as it did. The three themes that we see central to the story are motherhood, tradition, and slavery. Women and mothers, specifically their failures, are central to the theme of the story. Anwar's mother Bedua feels as though she's a failure because of her inability to train her daughter into becoming a woman that is accepted by their society and tradition. Anwar throughout the entirety of the story we realize struggle with the idea of not being able to give birth to a child of her own. Throughout the story we get snippets of how she perceives she would have trained up her daughter she thinks that she, had, she would have trained her daughter to be a woman who spoke her mind, who did things for herself, and who, in a way, diluted the type of authority and control that men had in their traditional setting. In this, we see subtle references to feminism, where Anwar is represented as a woman who is unlike women of her time, a woman that's willing to take care of herself, that defies what society has set down as standards by which women will have to act and conform so we see that the the theme of feminism runs through every here because the main issue that her society her parents her husband had with her was the fact that she did not conform she did not act like the typical woman that tradition stipulates tradition is another thing that runs strongly throughout the play we realize that all of Anwar's problems 
stems from the fact that she represents what their society abhors the most a woman that is willing to choose her own life and elevate her station all on her own the fact that her story ends in tragedy only reinforces the set standards that society has made for women at their time because then her tragedy becomes a lesson for other women other um, young women in that society who would want to tour the line of Anwa because she ended up in tragedy the the story completely changes the narrative is if you go against tradition if you don't act the way that society stipulates that women should act then it ends wrongly so throughout the story all that we see is that there's a constant conflict between old and new tradition and it is replicated between the relationship between Anwa and her mother Anwa and her father the old man and the old woman so tradition is a theme that runs strongly throughout the story the last theme that we see running through the story is slavery the play makes allusion to the physical act of slavery buying people which we see that Anwa is strongly against however there's also the slavery that is um, indicated through Anwa's life tradition her husband her station everything seeks to enslave her the fact that she cannot get the life that she chooses the life that she wish to live be the woman that she feels she's meant to be keeps her in a cage that's in the end leads her to commit suicide so these are the three themes that we see running strongly throughout the story Anwa. The last thing that we are going to be discussing are the literary devices that Amaya Teidu employs in the writing of the play Anwa. The first thing that we are going to be looking at is her use of symbolism. And to make this, to explain even further, I'm going to read an excerpt from the book where Anwa has a dream where she, she becomes Africa, for lack of a better word. So she says, I dreamt that I was a big, big woman. And from my insides were huge holes out of which poured men, women, and children. And the sea was boiling hot and steaming. And as it boiled, it threw out many, many giant lobsters, bald lobsters, each of whom, as it fell, turned into a man or a woman, but keeping its lobster head and claws. And they rushed to where I sat and seized the men and women as they poured out to me. And they tore them apart and dash them to the ground and stand on them. And from their huge courtyards, the women ground my men and women and children on mountains of stone. But there was never a cry or a murmur, only a busting of a ripe tomato or a swollen pot. And everything went on and on. Since then, every time there's a mention of a slave, I see a woman who is me and a bursting as of a ripe tomato or a swollen pot. This is at page 46, if you have the book. So then you can see that in the dream, Anwa sees herself as Africa. And the dream that she had is a symbol of slavery that happened on the continent. The, the lobsters represent the slavers or the colonialists that came in. And also, when you take a look at the story, it goes on to explain or to take a critical look at how Ghanaians helped perpetuate this wrong, this injustice, by involving themselves in the slave trade. So perhaps this is the reason why Anwa abhorred the idea of buying slaves so much because of this dream she had, because she felt as though she was a representation of the continent and what was being stolen, and that by engaging in slavery, she was enabling the system that was destroying everything that was good about our continent. Another thing that we'll look at is irony. So, um, Ama Etedu employs irony a lot, and one example of that is situational irony. At the point where Anwa tells her mom that she's leaving the house to go marry Kofi Aho, if they do not approve of her decision, her mother says as she's leaving that, let her go and may she walk well. So, even though her mom says that, let her go and may she walk well, she does not actually mean that Anwa should end up well. Underneath this is sarcasm, is the 
is 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 a, is an example of situational irony where you say something that you actually do not mean. So even though that one would surmise that she meant well for her daughter, in actual sense she was hurt and she felt betrayed by the decision of her daughter. So that is not what she meant. So this brings us to the end of our book review for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Remember that if you have any questions, leave them in the comment section and please come back to the page next week Monday for our next book review. I'll see you then.